this passage is arguably one of the most amazing passages because it deals with a mother, a mother who loves her children and is just seeking the very best for them. It's one of those passages that you can read either one or two ways. The one side, you could read it in a positive way, where a mother genuinely seeks the best for her children. And the other side, where it is, could be seen in a negative way, where she's trying to unfairly gain advantage for her children. We've just come through a grueling year, where our young folk had to, with all the odds stacked against them, excel at university, at school, and try to make it work under very difficult circumstances. And so we salute every one of you who is intentional in being successful in the tasks that are laid before you. Like every mother, today we're going to speak about Mrs. Zebedee. But like every mother, she has dreams for her children. She wishes the very best for them. She desires for them to really and truly excel in life, to do well, and to be able to live upright and righteous lives. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. We find that she then arrives, and she humbly sits before Jesus Christ and asks him one of the most courageous questions that she would, uh, he would allow them to sit on his left and his right side in his kingdom. The nice thing is that she recognizes that Jesus Christ was a man that had a kingdom, that he was indeed a ruler, and that she felt that, if anything, I'm going to the main guy to speak to him about my children. We live in a world that deals with competition. We love watching athletics. We love reading about who the fastest, who the quickest, the smartest, and the strongest is. In fact, the Guinness Book of Record outstrips so many other books annually as the best seller list because we want to know who is now the very best in the world. I think they had a race recently where they saw who can run with an egg for the furthest they can go. Now, maybe that is your bag where you want to run with a potato or an egg and really be the best in that. And I say, go your gums, do your thing, and be the best. We watch movies or rather programs like Survivor. Who wants to be a millionaire? And we watch these programs because we want to see what actually was the way for them to be able to be successful. We love sport games, board games, and we love to watch those things that are just amazing. And that's pretty much why she came to Jesus. She had great dreams of happiness for her children. And maybe today you are sitting down and you're frowning at this lady and saying, you know what, that is just crazy being so ambitious and in fact, trying to even walk on behalf of your children is just absolutely crazy. But I want to tell you that ambition is not always wrong. Ambition is not always wrong if you're seeking the right thing for the right child. That you're seeking the right thing for him and specifically the righteous thing for their lives. Today I want to speak to moms. Last week we spoke to fathers. What is the ambition for your children? What do you desire the very best is for your children? I know that so often mothers and fathers, although they pray together, they often pray apart from each other. What do you say in those moments? What do you talk to God about your child? What do you ask of God to do for them? You see, what is so ironic in this story is that Jesus Christ was thinking about the cross. He was imminently going off to be crucified, and the mother comes to him and says to him, she wants the most prominent place for her children. 
It is a recurring theme within the Gospels. Who is the greatest? Who is the most important one? And sadly, there is one portion where they speak about who is the one that Jesus loves the most. But Mrs. Zebedee decides that she's going to put an end to this argument, and she's going to talk to Jesus herself. Verse 20 and 21 says, She came to him and her sons with her sons. Kneeling down, she asked something of him, and she says, What, he asked her, what do you wish? He says, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. Now, before you are too harsh on Mrs. Zebedee, I want you to know that it is quite normal or culturally uh, uh, it, it, it is a cultural almost, um, I was going to say, not epidemic, but for a Jewish mother to have an inordinate amount of involvement in the life of her son. We do not consult Wikipedia because it is probably one of the weakest sources you can, but for argument's sake, I had a look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia says the stereotype of Jewish mothers generally involves Listen to this. A nagging, overprotective, manipulating, controlling, smothering, and overbearing mother or wife. One who persists in interfering in her children's lives long after they have become adults. Now today you might say, hang on a minute. If they're talking about Jewish people, I didn't know my mom was Jewish. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that actually is quite interesting when I read it and I thought you've got to hear this because I love good humor. But you know what? Sometimes they can be a, a bit overbearing in the lives of her ch their children. But the key behind it is, again, that she desired that which is best for her children. And it's not wrong to do that. Now, whether they are family or not, it's clear that Jesus Christ loved James and John. And along with Peter, they were three of the top guys that were closest to Jesus Christ. When Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, the only ones with him were Peter, James, and John. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he took Peter, James, and John, and further than he took the rest. In other words, these three guys were closer to Jesus Christ. And it's, it's quite ironic that when we look at studies nowadays, it's very interesting to find that you will have layers of friendships. There are people that you really and true are just closer to than others. Don't feel bad. Jesus Christ had the same. But here there is something very different. Is that Jesus Christ was asked for seats of power. Seats of power on his left and his right hand. It might as well could have been James and John. And he, she probably felt that with Jesus probably out the picture, who's going to take over from him? I want to tell you a quick story. In, back in 2000, there was a Summer Olympics that was held in Sydney, Australia. And that year, the honor to be the first Australian runner to carry the flame on the way to Sydney was given to an 11-year-old girl who happened to be the daughter of the top Olympic official in Australia, Kevin Gosper. Kevin didn't give his, son, his daughter that honor, but when it was given to her, he didn't do anything to stop it. And so he was criticized by a lot of people who thought it was inappropriate because it looked like nepotism and favoritism for his daughter. They thought that he should have let her decline the offer. But his response was, he says, my daughter was offered to be the torchbearer. Who was I to take that away from her? I was looking after the best interest of my child. And here's pretty much what you see when you look at Mrs. Zebedee. She looked after the best interest of her children. So many of us want our children to be the best soccer player. We want him to be the prefect. I spoke to a young man the other day who's at a school up in Johannesburg, and he's an exceptionally bright student. 
And he said to me, Uncle D, what was so sad for me and really disappointed me was that I was not chosen as one of the prefects. And so I asked him, I said, what did you see? He says, what I saw was that all the folk who were really prominent people within the school, their children became prefects. And my parents, in fact, is on a scholarship, 100% scholarship. I want you to know this boy is exceptionally bright and he's, in fact, doing second-year calculus at the moment. He's in, only in matric this year. And he was saying to me, because my parents aren't very, bright, uh, very prominent, I was not granted to be a prefect. And I asked him, let me ask you a question. How are you going to revision this moment or this disappointment? He said, I can't. I'm battling. And I said to him, do you know the workload that comes with being a prefect? Oh, yeah. It's quite a lot of work. You get involved in this, that, and the other. And he says, time is really taken up by a lot of tasks that prefects have got to do. And then I asked him, what do you need most for where you want to be? He wants to major in mechatronics, in robotics. And he's also tutoring first-year students in mathematics at the university. We're talking about a matriculant that since grade 11 was tutoring students at university. He said, you know, Uncle D, I've never thought of it. You see, th this is the key. He says, when you want to be what you need to be, you need to say no or when you are overlooked. See it as the greatest blessing. Because that time which would have been invested in something else, now you can invest in something that you really want to do. Here's some positive things about this mother. First of all, she believed that Jesus would one day have a kingdom of his own. You see, very few people actually believe that. So give her credit that she knew and understood who he was. Secondly, she was willing to stand up for her children. This mother probably would have spoken to her husband, Zeb, and said, hey, Zeb, can't we speak to Jesus about our sons? And Zeb probably would have said, nope, I'm not doing that. And probably she said, well, if you don't want to do it, I'll do it. If you don't want to speak up for our children, I will. And so here you find a mother that drives the process. That drives the process, and she is the greatest uh, 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 cheerleader of the fan club for her children. Let me say, firstly, that's not wrong. It's commendable. Thirdly, she prays that her sons might be part of the kingdom. I cannot think anything better for a mother to pray for. I honestly can't see any desire that is wrong with what she's asking. You see, we only see one aspect to it, but there is much more to this. You probably find that she would have heard in Matthew 16, 26, when Jesus Christ said to him, what does it matter if people gain the whole world but lose their souls? And so often us as parents are let me say this, I'm not going to use the word misguided, but we press the emphasis on the wrong area of the lives of our children. Where we should be pushing, where Mrs. Zebedee is saying, I want my children to be part of a kingdom. A kingdom that will outlast everything in this world. The bottom line is that she saw something far greater than many other women would see. And so today we are not her critic, but we commend her for keeping the main thing the main thing. Being able to bifurcate between that which is temporary and to acknowledge that which is eternal. And also finding the preeminence of that which is eternal and that which is spiritual over that which is secular. Fourthly, she did not only pray for her children that they would be part of the kingdom, but she prayed for them to be actively involved in the kingdom. 
here's one of the most important things of us as parents, is not only to have our children as part of, but to be involved. And that is why Sunday school teaching is so important, that we become part of shaping the spirituality of our children. And that we would say, put me on, I'm in. So often, we don't encourage our children to pursue spiritual goals. Because we feel that, you know what, sometimes they're really going to battle out there because financially it's not exactly the most rewarding, and that is true. And it's true that in this world, it, the, the, the measure of importance and value is slightly different than in the secular world. And so we steer our children away from that which would take them possibly into a mission field where they will be killed for their faith. And so we have them involved in something secular where they can earn a living, provide a house for their families. And we ignore the fact that Jesus Christ had said that he would reward those and bless those who have left houses or lands and he would give them in this life far more than just that which is temporary, but he will also give them eternal life. Jesus answers this lady after she asks him a question where he would actually give them preeminence or prominence. And Jesus says to her, ma'am, ma'am, do you know what you are asking? Weet jy wat jy vra? I would imagine she would have looked at him and said, Duh, I've thought about this so many times. And Jesus clarifies that, and he says, Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am being baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it is prepared for by my Father. George Bernard Shaw made a comment many years ago and said, there are two tragedies in life. One is to lose your heart's desire, and the second one is to gain it. Jesus said to James and John, are you sure you want me to give you what you've asked for. Are you sure that this is what you want? And that is why the cost of discipleship is such a high premium. The T's and C's must be ironed out. They must be considered. They must be put on the table because Jesus never ever tried to hide those. You see, at the end of the day, Jesus Christ was talking about the cup of suffering. Jesus had another cup in mind. He talked about the cup of suffering, and a few days later, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went a little further, fell on his face, and prayed, Oh, Father, is it, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The cup that he was about to drink was the cup of suffering. It was not just an immersion into water and remission of sin. It was an immersion into suffering. But that suffering was necessary. And they were right. That they would drink the same cup. James was the first apostle to die. In Acts chapter 12, we know that Herod Agrippa had him killed by the sword. We know that John lived on the island of Patmos in exile for the rest of his life, separated from those whom he cared for and loved. A mother that desires the best for her children is a good mother. A good mother who loves the very best. And today, if you and I talk about the very best, we are talking about the kingdom of God. We are talking about the very best, not just a, a smidgen of 
greatness that this world could possibly give. But the idea that you and I would live a life that makes a difference in the lives of others. You see, Jesus Christ made it very, very clear that if you are willing to suffer, you can follow me. Let's look at the responses very briefly of the other disciples. The ten heard about this, they were indignant. And the two brothers were the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know. Now, I want you to listen to this amazing way that Jesus Christ deals with ambition. And we could probably, within the context, talk about selfish ambition. But Jesus Christ, the consummate gentleman, the Lord of glory and the Father of all of humanity, always seeks the very best for his children and Jesus says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Indeed, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The bickering backed up a bit because Jesus Christ was making it very clear that in the kingdom of God there is things far deeper than having authority. Being the top dog, calling the shots. You see, God says that here everyone can be great. You're looking for greatness, says Martin Luther King. You've come to the right place. Because everyone can serve. Everyone can serve. Everyone has a rightful place that is of equal importance before an awesome God that works together. Let's face it. There's a lot of ambition in this world. We often find that people cut corners, lie on expense reports. They spread malicious gossips. <clears throat> abuse authority, and they stab each other in the back, and all it is in order to get ahead. But Jesus Christ's words are simple and cutting. Not so with you. Not so with you. In other words, Jesus Christ <clears throat> is making it very clear that inside of the kingdom where he is Lord, he will never tolerate that kind of treatment. Why? Because you and I are family. You see, all they've had <coughs> to model their thoughts on was what was happening in the secular world. And Jesus Christ says, you want to be a servant? You want to be great? Good. Good. Become part of the kingdom. You never ask the question, what's in it for me? And what is the kingdom doing for me? When you start, you always say, Lord, what is there that you want to do or want me to do? You understand in Matthew 6, seeking first the kingdom of God and all the other things will find its rightful place. I want to speak to our young folk a little bit. This year... You're going to be drinking a cup that is going to be nice at times and at times going to be tough. And you'll be tempted at times to miss service or Bible study. But I want to say this to you. That when you might this year want to follow Jesus or you are following him, what Jesus is asking you and me, mother and father, is to put God first. I've studied for many, many years. I've never missed a service. Can I just tell you the following? One morning I heard a joke. Sorry, I'm going to share this quickly. Of a preacher that was lying in bed and his wife said, you need to get up. And he says, I'm tired, man. Do you think they'll miss me this morning? He says, I reckon they will. 
Why, babe? Why? I'm so tired. You're the preacher, but you might ask the same question about you. I'm tired. I've been out late last night with my mates on Saturday night. Tired. You might ask the question, why? He says, because you'll be missed. You'll be missed because these are vital. I love what Johann said just now. We are so excited to see everybody. We are in abnormal circumstances, but we are together in this. This year, I want you to know that following Jesus is going to cost you. It's going to cost you to put him first. It's going to cost you to say, no, I will study on a Saturday, and I will study after service. But I'll be here. Why? Because I will be missed. You see, Mrs. Zebedee was right. She kept the main thing the main thing, and she wanted the very best for her children. I know, because so did Jesus. Let's stand and close our final song, and we'll close our service for this morning. If anybody needs prayers or encouragement, we pray that we meet with you and pray with you. Let's stand and sing.